Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. A very good morning to you, and you're welcome to this week's Signpost webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about opportunities for anaerobic digestion in Ireland. And with the increasing emphasis on renewable energy and sustainable waste management, what role could anaerobic digestion play in generating clean energy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and fostering a more circular and resilient economy? And I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Morris Deasy, who's a postdoctoral researcher in anaerobic dig- digestion based here in Athenry, Chagask in Athenry. Good morning, Morris. You're welcome to today's webinar. Morning. Thank you very much for having me on. It's great to, great to have you here. And good morning, Pass. You're going to help us out with questions. Good morning. And uh, Morris, you're, um, uh, you have uh, a number of different uh, interests in the agri-food sector, but uh, anaerobic digestion you're going to talk about today. Maybe could, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, Morris Deasy, um, engineer by background, working on researching anaerobic digestion, but farming also at home um, and also do brewing as well. So a few different uh, sectors that I'm interested in, basically. Very good, very good. So um, you're going to be talking to us today about, you know, the potential of anaerobic digestion and uh, some of the, the practical issues that are associated with the rollout. I, I know that the government does have ambitious targets around anaerobic digestion. Is that right? Yeah, it'll all be in the slides. But yeah, no, they've, they've ambitious targets and there's going to be more movement in it. So, um, But in a general sense, there's not always a huge amount of knowledge out there. So hopefully this can kind of shed light sort of on the background to AD and what it is and what it could mean for farmers. So yeah. that's yeah. that's what I hope for anyway. Okay, well, let's get straight into the slides, I think. We don't want to steal your thunder. So without further ado, Maris, we'll hand over to you and uh, we'll take some questions afterwards. So outline of this talk, we're going to I'm going to give a background to anaerobic digestion and try and explain it as best I can. Give some of that policy background as well, looking forward. Um, and in the fleet project, basically, we've done a lot of work around silage and suitable types of silage. Talk about digestion as a fertilizer and then the economics of providing silage for AD. And then that farmer willingness to adopt AD. That's kind of one of the other issues. So kind of a broad outline, um, but hopefully we'll... Uh, cover all things. So generally an anaerobic digestion plant, you're taking organic manures and um, originally it would be a lot based off process waste, uh, food waste, sludges, things like that, and slurry, animal slurry, so cattle, pig, poultry, mushroom. Um, and what you put in, you get back out, you get back out a digestate, which is what we'll talk about as the fertilizer. Equally, as AD kind of became used as an energy source, um, so you can use AD just to process waste, but you can also use it to create energy. And that's where the silages came in. And typically in Germany, a lot of maize is used. In the UK, you've got beet and whole crop, um, but also grass. So, But equally, in an Irish context, we're talking a lot more about grass um, because 90% of our agricultural area is grassland. Um, and equally, we think we can produce grass without chemical nitrogen, which is important in terms of sustainability. Um, but what's the main output? The main output from an AD plant is biogas, which is methane and CO2. And typically, the plants that are operating in Ireland are burning that in a CHP, so combined heat and, and power. And that's an engine, basically, that produces heat and electricity. Uh, so electricity is sold to the grid, and that heat then is used either in a district heating system, so in Germany that would heat a local village, or in process heat, so a pol- heating a poultry unit or some factory or cheese processor or something like that. The electricity, two kind of ways of doing it. One is constant power where the engine's running 24 hours a day, and the other ones are power on demand, um, where they run to deal with peak power, either for the grid, they run for nine o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the evening or in a dairy unit it would be just when you need those compressors or something like that take the power then um and i suppose the other thing like in the future there's a shift away from power constant power towards power on demand and and that is when they're being paid a premium for that electricity because the thing about an ad plant is it's running 24 hours a day the bugs are always making gas so that creates the a power that you can actually store and use when you want it, which is a big difference between solar and wind. We can only produce power from solar when it's sunny, and we can only do it from wind when it's windy, um, which therefore AD possibly could demand a premium over that. Um, but 
that's and the other the other thing though as well though is in rural areas you do need to have demand for the heat if you don't have demand for that heat you're going to be wasting that so currently there's actually the schemes for solar and wind in ireland but we don't have any schemes open at the moment for ad um so they're not really valuing that power and demand so the new kind of show in town is upgrading to biomethane and what's the difference there you still the same ad plant you're producing biogas but you're then upgrading it to clean it to biomethane which is just clean P- ch4 or methane and carbon dioxide so what can you do with the methane you can pump that into the gas grid to be used wherever you need you can use it in trucking heavy goods transport and now there's biomethane tractors which is quite exciting basically uh, the carbon dioxide we can use that in food and beverage and during the war in ukraine that that was a very important bit and um, could be stored or else you could actually use it with green hydrogen to make more gas and store that instead of using batteries. And um, so that'll be a important technology in the future. Um, important thing to highlight though is economies of scale. A, these upgrading to biomethane, these are big plants um, and they need the economies of scales to make the upgrader pay. An AD plant itself can be as small as an IBC. It, you know, a CHP engine doesn't have to be huge. It could just look after the power needs of a farm. But if you're upgraded by methane, they do need to be large scale to make the economics work, basically. So policy context. Uh, we have the Climate Action Plan here in Ireland for 2023, and that's set as a target in agriculture, 25% emissions reduction. And in that context, our slurry tanks are our slatted sheds they do contribute to our emissions of methane and um, so that's where ad and biomethane if we were taking that slurry out of agriculture and digest it cap digesting it capturing that methane that would help reduce our emissions so there's actually a target of 5.7 terawatt hours of biomethane by 2030 and that's approximately 10 percent of the gas grid so it's not all of our grid but it is it is a decent chunk of it um, and it can help to do our agricultural emissions. And where is that power going to come from? Um, so this is the pie chart here is an F from an SEAI study, and they're looking at where ca- where can this resource come from. And so pig slurry, food waste, industrial waste, those are all very good um, sort of resources or feedstocks to use for AD, but they are limited. And as time goes on, we should be reducing food waste. We shouldn't be increasing food waste. So the big potential in terms of reaching those big, large numbers is in grass, cattle slurry and grass silage. That's where they really see that they could actually reach that. And that kind of put our focus onto that side of things. Now, the other kind of policy context is red too, the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, and that sets greenhouse gas emission savings um, for biomethane. So you can't be u- burning lots of diesel to make renewable gas. They're setting targets as to what to do it. Now they have different targets for transport because say heavy goods transport is very difficult to, to decarbonize. We have electric cars, we don't have electric trucks right now. Um, so that it's giving a credit into that transport section. But you can see there, you need to be used up at 70 and 80% basically renewable. And that's where while the grass silage is providing um, a huge amount of energy, you need to be careful how it's produced and how much emissions is associated with the production. The other thing is in the context when we're looking at Northern Ireland and the UK, which have an awful lot of AD plans, they are now outside the EU, so they don't have a red two directive. So some of their policy is different. So just kind of be careful when you're thinking about Ireland versus the rest. So producing silage without chemical nitrogen, uh, Typically, we're pretty much grass-based, um, but this slide here that I've robbed from John Finn, if we add legumes in with our grass, we can produce grass silage basically without chemical nitrogen. And chemical nitrogen has a huge emission that needs to be accounted for in red too. So therefore, that's what we're proposing is shifting towards a grass clover or a multi-species, so grass, clover, and herbs. Because the higher your legume proportion, the further to the right of that graph goes, the more you can produce tons of dry matter per hectare without chemical nitrogen. So that's the green line there is about 12 tons. So if you get up to 30%, they've no trouble producing 10 tons dry matter on 30% clover in your sward. And that's, there's up at 16 tons and um, it can be produced. So that's You know, Clavin et al. did it in Grange over five years. They're producing 16 tonnes of dry matter per hectare per year. 
So that's long-term studies. So what are the barriers with clover? There is issues around rotational grazing, longer rest periods, higher residuals. There's a fear of bloat out there. So th to me, those aren't issues in producing silage for an ED plant. So I think that's kind of an easy, low-hanging fruit, basically. So this is kind of gets to us what the outline of what we're looking at for agri-biomethane here. So I'm, I'm discounting the waste side because I'm saying that's a separate sector. We're talking about agri side here because we are Chagos, right? So we're talking about silage using clovers and slurry and feeding those into an AD plant, upgrading that to biomethane and using that digestate out the far side. So in generalized figures, you're talking about 50-50 kind of a blend on a fresh weight basis and tons of material basically of silage and slurry. Now, 80% of that power of the power will be coming from the silage, 20% coming from the slurry and even less. However, there is some emissions associated with silage. So you can't go to 100% because you need to reach your red two targets. You do have diesel of harvesting and stuff like that. So that's where the slurry actually, you're offsetting those emissions. That methane would have been released into the atmosphere. So by putting it into an AD plant, you're capturing it and therefore you get this credit. So it'll always be a balance between those two feedstocks to actually reach your targets. A um, couple of sort of important points when you're thinking from a farmer's perspective, uh, water doesn't make bioglass biogas. So really watery slurry is not what an AD plant is going to want to feed into their 10 or 20 million euro plant. They don't want water sitting there doing nothing. They want the, ener the energy, the carbohydrates, things like that to actually the dry matter really that's producing the biogas. So that's where they don't like, it's going to be important how we actually collect that slurry and how fresh it is. And the other one for, is silage. Fiber doesn't make biogas either. So those big high yields of very kind of uh, lignocellulose silage, very good for feeding a suckler cow, good, good for the rumen health, but that's not what an AD plant wants. So the AD plant in Grange that Chagas is commissioning, this is what you call a pilot biomethane plant. Um, and just to give an example, that's going to take 10 tons of silage a day uh, and nearly 15 tons of slurry a day. So that's from about 70 hectares of silage and a thousand cattle. And that's a balance, 84% coming from the silage of the energy, 16% coming from the cattle side of it. So the slurry doesn't produce the energy, but it's important for a greenhouse gas emission savings. So that would produce about 3.2 gigawatt hours per year. Um, and in the context, when we're say the KPMG Devonish report on AD, they were looking at a typical plant, biomethane plant of being 20 and 40 gigawatt hours. So you're nearly 10 times bigger. So that's, you're talking about 100 tons of silage a day, 150 tons of slurry. Like that's, that's why we're talking economies of scale. These are big plants. They're not small plants. So digest it as a fertilizer. Um, basically all AD plants create organic fertilizer because what goes in must come out. And typically there is food waste or there is organic materials going in and they're processing it and bringing it out as a digestate. And what's important with a digestate is it's increasing the nutrient availability of the organic manure. And that's generally down to the improved carbon to nitrogen ratio, which improves the fertilizer value for the for farmer. So while some of these feedstocks are going onto farms already, putting it through an AD plant would actually kind of process it and improves the fertilizer value, which I think is an important thing. Mainly in terms of crop production, you're talking about an increase of ammonia content of digestate versus slurry. And that is the faster release nitrogen and the plant available. Um, which is good for output. So this is kind of typical analysis, basically, of cattle slurry versus digestate. Very similar in terms of dry matter percentage. So you can use low emission slurry. You don't need to change your system in terms of spreading. Um, but if you see there, your nitrogen content is increased over cattle slurry. And that's the big difference. This is becoming more like a fertilizer because you have more nitrogen and it's more available. So you get much better crop response. So in terms of nitrates, which is very topical, and organic load distribution, there's, there's an advantage in AD plants in terms of spreading our nutrients evenly. If farms were exporting cattle slurry to an AD plant, you're exporting it off farm, right? And then you're re-importing it onto the farm. So for me, I think it's very important in terms of how it's spread on farm, that it's, it's spread to out farms, say, um, it's or silage ground compared to the grazing base. If it's coming back on a truck, that truck can be delivered to aid farms. So we could actually get this 
nutrients spread evenly across the land, which I think is very important in terms of nitrates and water quality, and equally between farms, because we do have highly stocked farms and we do have low low stocking rate farms. So can we get these nutrients spread evenly throughout the country? That would be very important. Uh, and that's down to collaboration, that basically... Is there a lack of collaboration right now that this this slurry isn't spreading around the place? I think AD could play an important role in that collaboration to get these nutrients spread. The other thing, as in terms of replacing chemical fertilizer, it replaces chemical fertilizer if people reduce the chemical fertilizer that they're using. And that comes down to having verifiable data about the nutrient content of the digestate so as they know what they're spreading. Typically, farmers don't know what's in their slurry. They're assuming uh, nutrient content. Whereas if it's coming from an ADE plant, they're going to have an analysis saying that's how much N, P and K is in your, your fertilizer. And there's another thing around contaminants. And that's where I'm very big on the agri versus waste AD. Agri AD, it's the same. You've got silage and slurry. It's the same as what you were spreading on your farm already. Waste AD is a different thing. Now, if particularly if you're using um, food waste, is there spoons and plastic and all sorts of things in there? So that's why I kind of differentiate between the two things. One's a waste processing, one is an agri based. Um, and that's the data is kind of to create trust. But with a better, with, with digestate as a fertilizer, it's got better nutrients. It's more available. Timing of application is going to be very important. We're not going to be able to spread it when the soil isn't warm, when we don't have the plants there to absorb it. So therefore, it probably is going to be into March and April, just before you're you're closing the ground for silage um, to get optimum uptake of those nutrients. But you're, you're getting it out the far side. So happy days. Um, and it's going to need to be less and it's going to be need to be covered storage on farm. <laughs> <clears throat> so if you're exporting slurry from a slatted tank you're prob- and you want it back to be sitting there on the farm ready to spread, it's probably going to need to be in a covered store, a separate store. But then you've got more storage, which is a positive, basically, in terms of using your nutrients effectively. So and then on a landscape level, processing of the digestate is going to be critical for transporting slurries large distances. So this is in from terms of zones that have high nutrient loading. Could we spread them further distances? Uh, and that separation, solid and liquid, extraction of ammonia, dewatering, and then long-term biochar is going to be very important because that's a way of actually car- capturing carbon and sequestering it long-term in our soils. So those are all things that can be enabled by AD plants and having these centralized facilities, processing large quantities. It makes the economics of processing that stuff much easier, basically. So I would see that as an important step down the line, basically. So... AD as a nutrient distribution hub. And this is where the concept of a co-op in terms of farmers will be very important. So are, are you ex- so why would you export your slurry? It's increasing your, your storage. It's increasing the fertilizer value of that, that slurry when you get it back. And um, you can reduce your organic loading. So if you're pre- taking slurry, sending to an AD plant, you don't necessarily have to get it back. And that comes down to if the nutrient opportunity cost is valued, you could get a credit when you supply the slurry and if you don't need it, that's fine. You could cash in that credit. Someone else will use it and need it. And particularly in arable farms, they may ne- well need that uh, organic fertilizer. So you could sell it to the uh, to the arable farms, essentially, using the AD plant as the intermediary. Uh, and the other one is in time, why would you export your slurry to take back digestate? Well, if you were able to say, well, okay, I've exported all my slurry. I've reduced my emissions by that 10%. That's a useful thing. Once that's valued. And the other thing is if you're not measuring, you're not managing, you're exporting that slurry, you're getting you're getting it back as a fertilizer and you know where to spread it, how to spread it. That's an important kind of concept. So in terms of the silage side of the house, right? If we're growing the silage, putting it into an AD plant, we need to bring that digestate back to to grow the grass. However, there is an issue there in terms of growing grass red clover. We don't need the nitrogen to grow grass red clover. If you spread chemical nitrogen onto clover, you actually slightly reduce the yield over the course of a year. So therefore, this is where we looked at different scenarios in terms of should we then use that digestate in a different part of agriculture and actually just spread P and K on the silage ground? Because by bringing that digestate to another part of agriculture, we're now offsetting N, P and K. We're offsetting that nitrogen. Um, And that's that nitrogen saving, which has further greenhouse gas savings. Um, which is important, basically. So the work on the fleet project, we looked at the economics of existing feedstocks and using the National Farm Survey, and we looked at the years 2018 to 2020. 
in all of this data, there's no, we're not using a land charge or rent. And we haven't said that farmers are going to be building these stores um, or more silage pits or anything. Equally, typical silage systems within Ireland, we're talking about one and two cuts, basically, on average, are the most popular. There is three and four cuts coming into it. But an AD, a grass red clover for an AD plant, we're talking three cuts at least, basically. High quality silage is what we want with high energy content. Um, we model a 14 tonnes dry matter per hectare yield, basically, using Clavin, basically. And the results I show here are using that 42% digestate reuse on a crop. So that's actually saying first cut of silage is fertilised using digestate. Second and third cut, you're selling that digestate to somewhere else and you're buying P and K, basically, to balance balance out your nutrients. Uh, and we're also not plowing up grassland and um, low disturbance systems is what we're modeling. Because economically, I don't see the justification of plowing grassland, basically. the So this is some of our results. Uh, this is the effect of the nutrient opportunity cost, basically, on the cost of silage. And this is our eight, 18 to 20. So on the right-hand side, we've got a perennial ryegrass. That's our typical grass system, 100% of digestate, and you're topping up with nitrogen to get your yield, basically. The box I just highlighted there, that's your perennial ryegrass red clover, 100% digestate using, so that's supplying all your P and K uh, and nitrogen as well. So there's a cost saving of shifting from, from perennial ryegrass to red clover, principally on saving that nitrogen, basically. Now, as we move further left on this chart, we're using less digestate, so that is being sold basically to another eight industry the and this dark green chart that's showing where you're excluding the nutrient opportunity cost so you're just selling the silage and you're just buying p and k so there is an increase in cost if you don't get money if you're not getting paid for that digestate that you are generating the corollary though is that if you do get paid for the n p and k value of that digestate you actually are making that silage cheaper so that's where i think that is long term be very important in an AD system. When you supply slurry or you supply silage, you're getting paid for what it is, but equally for the, that opportunity cost of NP and K. So the other thing that we did was we compared the profit of profitability of growing grass for AD compared with the existing farm systems. So that's it, within the NFS, you've got your cattle rearing, cattle udder, sheep, tillage, and dairying. Uh, and we use different prices of 30 euro a ton for silage, 35 and 40 euro a ton. And that's on the right hand side here, you can see the um, that's the dairy sector. And basically, the profitability of dairying is always going to be higher than producing grass silage for AD, unless they're given a heck of a price for a silage, basically. Now, for the tillage sector, it's more net neutral. At 40 euro a ton, you could make more. Um, and, now, and this is for average. So it's not saying for every crop within an arable rotation. It's just saying that on average, it's not very likely necessarily that a, a tillage farmer would go towards um, growing grass for AD. For your sheep and cattle enterprises, once the price does get to 40 euro a ton, then it does look to be more viable, economically viable to sell grass for AD compared to your existing system. Now, the context of that 40 euro a ton, silage was being sold on the market for less than that. So I think it is important. And the other context, if you think of the tillage incentive scheme, that was 400 euro a hectare. And it was, you know, farmers did put crops in, but it wasn't complete. We didn't stop the whole industry overnight, basically. So that's where I would use that 400 euro a hectare as kind of one of this uh, measures of there needs to be increased profitability to actually make a farmer shift over from one system to another. Otherwise, why change? Why take the risk? We know we know the system we're operating. So that does mean if it, this is system is to take off, a good price does need to be paid basically to the farmers for their silage. Now, the other thing we did through the National Farm Survey was we did a survey around willingness to adopt. And we asked different questions around, would you supply silage? Would you pr produce silage, that silage with low nitrogen? Would you supply slurry? Would you receive digestate? And would you join an AD cooperative? Uh, and the big ticket kind of answer is those big red lines on the left. Most farmers, like near 65%, were saying, no, I wouldn't supply silage to an AD plant. And that's... We're kind of wor working through and uh, analyzing that and looking as, as to why. And I think a lot of that is down to awareness. If you don't know what AD is and you're asked, would you supply an AD plant? You say, well, no, because I don't know what an AD plant is. I don't know what it's doing. I don't know what it's benefiting agriculture. I don't know why, why it's benefiting the local community. Now, the other side of that is that actually 
there were that that fifteen percent of farmers who actually said, "Yeah, I would consider it if it's at market price. I consider exporting silage." That's actually probably enough farmers to supply five point seven terawatt hours and ten percent of the gas grid. So that is actually the positive side of it. We don't need every farmer to do this in terms of supplying grass. We need a small amount of farmers supply grass. Supplying slurry, you're going to need a lot more slurry to run these AD plants. But the other interesting bit was in terms of the answers for would you receive digestate, a lot more farmers said yes. And that is nearly all farmers, I'd say, would recognize the value of organic fertilizers over the bag, that it is much better for soil health. So therefore, that's kind of an important result. The other one is on joining a cooperative, is that lack of knowledge kind of slowing things things down uh, and do farmers want to be a part of that i think that this is an important question basically over time so coming towards the end of the presentation in terms of farming and ad i there's that question you know will it be competitive with with uh, will it be competition for agriculture or will it actually facilitate food production in this era where we're going to have to look at low carbon and what our emissions are and that's i think comes down to collaboration I, I think AD has a role in it in achieving some of our greenhouse gas emission savings, particularly from our slurry of, of, from ruminants, basically. Will there be competition for grass? Within the dairy sector, I don't see how that you can say that in terms of economics. Some of the other sectors, I think there will be a challenge between the economics of food production versus energy. Um, and that has its ethical um, implications. But at the end of the day, if you can't make money producing food, what do you do? Like the, there has to be these considerations as well. And there's also a context that with our nitrates re regulations, you can, on paper, you can grow more grass than then you can feed to a cow. So what do you do with the excess grass? Either you don't grow it, or actually maybe here's another market and provides an alternative, a diversification opportunity. Um, so I, yeah, I would think these two industries could be collaborations, However, it does depend who is leading this. Is this a farmer-led approach or is this VC firms coming in, being funded by pension funds and looking at the energy production and not looking at this collaboration between food and energy? Because the most best run systems, they're producing the two at the same time. Uh, and that's the most sustainable in my, in my eye. In terms of AD as a distribution hub for organic nutrients, we have the stick, which is nitrates, and it's being it's being used to to hit farmers, right? This could be the carrot. How, what do you do with all this slurry? We've got too many cows, and if a farm has too many cows, here's an opportunity. You could sell your, your Arctic load of slurry. You can get your certificate. Now you've reduced your organic loading. Um, and equally, in terms of nitrates, I suppose it is in terms of water quality, Agriculture is a big player, but we also have forestry, we've got industry, we've got human waste, all these other sectors are playing in on nitrates, right, and our water quality. So I think this would be an important step if agriculture actually embraced it and said, look, we're doing our bit. Let's make sure everyone else is doing their bits. Are we taking food waste and making sure all these other industries are getting benefits out of it as well? Uh, and in terms of policy, there is a context there of is digestate seen as an organic manure or is it seen as an organic fertilizer? My view would be that it should be it should be classified as an organic fertilizer. If it's being processed, if there's lots of data, it's being managed correctly and how it's spread. Um, so in terms of collaboration, the other big thing is that AD creates quite a lot of rural employment. We're going to have a lot of, if this was rolled out to get 5.7 terawatt hours, going to be a lot of contractors doing three and four cuts of silage. And that's a big shift from this kind of one cut system to three and four. It's a much more spread out workload. And then there's that slurry movement, there's digestate distribution. So there is an awful lot of work actually that needs to go on with AD. And the other one is, it you know, with climate change and everything, are we would we shift towards this idea that we're producing food and energy and mal managing that balance? Because we're pro providing energy security is a benefit to the country. Um, and the other one is, in terms of kind of a social side, what, what are you doing as a farmer? Yes, we're producing food, but are we also powering local transport companies? Are we powering the local bus? Are we heating the local schools and things like that? I think those would be important things basically to take into mind. Um, and there, that's a biomethane truck or a bus. There is biomethane trucks on the road. This is technology that exists and we can do it basically today. People talk about hydrogen as powering our trucks. 
Biomethane exists. It's, we can do it today. We can reduce our emissions and we can produce renewable energy, basically. So thank you very much. Uh, and that's my presentation. And thanks to our sponsors, SEAI and Gas Networks, for funding this research. That's great, uh, Morris. Thank you. And thanks for keeping on time. It leaves us loads of questions for our loads of time for lots of questions which have already come in. They're they're flying in the door here now. So uh, do do keep them coming. You're still sharing your screen there, Morris. So you might just want to stop, right, stop uh, sharing. Stop there doing we go. That. Um, so um, so Morris, uh, look, you talked about the you know the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the agri food sector, and I know you did include it in your slide. Could you just remind us there what that potential is. But I have more research to do on it. But typically what, what they would say is that, say, on a dairy farm, about 10% emissions could be associated with that slurry tank. Um, so that's that that slurry that's sitting in a tank, and over time that starts spreading, that starts emitting methane. So the advantage of AD is that if you were taking that slurry out of the, out of the farm, exporting to an AD plant, capturing that methane, and now we can use that as an energy source. So that's an important um, in terms of emissions reductions. Right. I think we'll go straight to questions, Pat, because... Uh, yeah, I suppose, I suppose one question there. following up from that is, is do you see that then uh, to, to stop that methane emissions that you would quickly export the slurry to a uh, to a plant and use your slurry storage at farm level to to store the digestate coming back from the plant rather than storing the, the, the slurry in the plant? Is that a... So, yeah, as in... In other countries, basically, it's like the milk lorry coming to collect the slurry. Um, so I would see that happening to, to collect the slurry fresh, that you're not leaving it there for months on end, basically. Because that unless you treat, you could treat that slurry so that you're preserving it in on farm, basically, and then it could be transported later. But that has a cost as well. The The simplest is slurry is collected fresh. Now, you would, you might, farms might need to change your infrastructure. Not all farms would be suitable, but we don't, at currently to do 5.7 terawatt hours, we don't need every ton of, of slurry to go out there. So some farms might make the decision to treat their slurry as opposed to exporting it to AD. Um, okay, I'll just go down through, There's, as, as Mark said, huge volume of questions. I don't think I've ever seen questions come in as, as thick and fast, So, but, but keep them coming and I'll try to get through as many as possible. Uh, does separation have a role in improving the economics uh, of logistics and perhaps extending uh, your feedstock radius, both in terms of uh, dewatering slurry going to the feedstock and similar for the digestate? Yeah, exactly. Like that transport, we don't want to have trucks of water going around the place. That No one's making money with water being transported around the place. So separation of slurry will be very important in terms of slurry in and our digestate back out. And in terms of distances, like we we don't want to be going huge distances with very watery content. So that's that post-processing of digestate, I think, would be very important for those zones that have high nutrient levels. Get all the organic waste into an AD plant separate it so as you're now putting out a really good compost with very good nutrient availability okay and i suppose is there any negatives in, in using poultry manure to replace cattle slurry poultry manure is very high in nitrogen very high in ammonia so you can only blend a certain amount into an ad plant and um, so that's if you look up north they're kind of taking a few tons of it in with all the other stuff so that's where i'd see those other resources being blended in at small quantities to keep a nice balance to the system, but it would have a benefit in terms of fertilizer. Do you know? Okay. And a similar question for pig slurry? Yeah, pig slurry, you have to be careful of antibiotics and other stuff, and it can be quite watery, um, but then you've got big houses and large quantities of it. So it, it they can all be used, basically, and you can tailor your process to how you want to do it, basically. Okay. So the... the uh... Availability of N in, in digested is more available. Uh, could the silage be grown using multi-species legume mixes and uh, just put digested back on the silage ground? That kind of thing yeah. Is kind of delicate. Yeah, yeah, so I kind of covered it, but I'll go over it. Essentially, yes, of course. Your digestate is a lovely balanced fertilizer. And um, I don't think we should be putting all the nitrogen back out on our multi-species in our grass red clover because we don't need all of it. Now, you can grow a super crop. There is an argument maybe around early grass, early in the season when the legumes haven't kicked into gear. But we need to do research on it to say, look, is, what's the effect of using some digestate, say, for first cut? 
Um, but theoretically, and if we did more processing, we could probably take the ammonia out of the digestate. And now we have ammonia fertilizer being produced in Ireland sustainably, and we have this digestate growing our crops. Okay, a, a tricky one for you. Uh, derogation farmers are not allowed to to import slurry, but if we're looking at the context of uh, d- digestate and, and, and AD, do we need to look at the regulation around that in terms of, of uh, export and re-import of the same? Exactly. Industry? So that's that's my little policy question is, is it an organic manure or is it an organic fertilizer? So if, if it's being processed and made into a fertilizer and separated, you know, that's not slurry in my view anymore. But, that, but that's a policy that's going to take DAFM, EPA, all of those to actually deal with that and see where. And that's, I think that the advantage of AD is you're talking about exporting these slurries into a company. They're going to have to prove where the nutrients went, how they're managed, and that it is sustainable. Because at the end of the day, biomethane is being sold as a renewable gas. The customer of that biomethane wants to prove that it's being used sustainably. It's not having adverse effect on the environment. So that's going to be very important for the AD operator as well. So less okay. cowboys, basically. One key question, I think that's that uh, may st- uh, still explain some of that red, those red bars that you had. Uh, is there any biosecurity risk with digestate? So at the moment, you have to pasteurize. If you're taking slurry from more than one farm, you have to pasteurize it. Now. There is debates around that because that's energy intensive. You have to heat everything up to 70 degrees for an hour and kill everything, basically, all sorts of bugs. Digested in itself is actually can be quite safe. So there would be an argument in time if we get this industry up and running, we should study this and see that actually digestate may in itself be pasteurized via its own process, that we don't need to burn this extra energy. But right now, the EPA and everyone is saying, no, you have to pasteurize, which as an engineer, you're like, lads, we might be burning energy for really no benefit. But that's that more research will and evidence will be needed for that. Yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a question in relation to uh, cooperatives and and the uh, I suppose the, the accessibility of cooperatives to to uh, um, get involved or to to create uh, um, I suppose business structures as cooperatives. Or is there an interest among the existing, say, dairy co-ops to get involved in, in, in this area of business? I'd be giving the existing co-ops a good kick and saying, come on, lads, it's time to get get moving. Uh, but equally, I, I think there will be probably standalone co-ops just around Digestate. In terms of, it, do you have a bunch of farms in an area with enough feedstock um, and I think it needs to be collaboration between different types of farms. Do you have livestock farmers in an area? Do you have arable? Do you have all these different types of farm? Do you have some dry stocker who are thinking about retiring and saying, do you know what, maybe it's safer not to have animals. I wouldn't mind growing the silage. So that's why I think it should be a collaboration. And that's how to make these really sustainable long-term is having everyone making their buck out of it and yeah. having a nice system basically. And I, I presume for ind- for farmers getting involved, the, the, the risk of putting in substantial investment before you get to the point of even getting to planning permission uh, is a huge turnoff for farmers getting involved. They just can't afford to take that risk with the level yeah. that's involved. And, and there is these large plants. They are huge capital outlays. Do you know what I mean? And that's it's like 10, 20 million of an investment. Like this is not small money. And the, is the market there to buy that renewable gas? So that's they are it'll probably be a balance between co-ops and getting finding money other other places basically but it's yeah there's large challenges to it i think it should happen it makes an awful lot of sense but it, it, it's not an easy road and that's why we don't have these ad plans everywhere just yet but do you see it as being more advantageous for farmers to get involved in that capital investment rather than at least being left i mean the 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 wind and, and the solar has been pretty much uh, made unaccessible for farmers and it's it's big corporates and big investment yeah. funds that are getting involved. And that's, look, I, th- I think we have a choice. Um, either farmers get involved with it and make this happen. And we're going to be, farmers have crucial role because they're providing feedstock and they're taking digestate. Without farmers, an AD plant is nothing, right? But we can sit on our hands and do nothing and let someone else come in and pre- and build these plans or farmers can get active. And that's, I, w- I would give a kick to the co-ops, but also to the farm organizations. They're not talking about this. This should be being engaged. We should be saying, we need to reduce our emissions. 
an AD industry will help will also help reduce another sector, which is energy. We can also help with some food waste in certain contexts if it's nice and clean. So that's why I think we need to get active and actually make this happen. Because if it's if it's built and operated by farmers, it'd be for farmers' benefits. You won't see this trade-off of energy versus food because the dairy farmer is producing his food and he's producing a feedstock on the side to feed this AD plant. So that's why I think it should be food first. It should be farmers involved in it. And a farmer, it should always be more profitable to produce food. The secondary should be energy. And that's that waste bit. I got extra silage grant into the AD plant. Off you go. That's the... And Morris, can you... Are there examples that you have come across in other countries where that more, we call it democratized approach or a farmer led approach is, is in place? And, you know, are there are there policies to support that or, or uh, public funding there to, to support that uh, that development of that that structure of a, of a, of a sector? Yeah, well, there's plenty of examples of AD plants across Europe, basically. Like Germany have their model. It was a lot of maize. Uh, Denmark is much more suitable. Now, they, they do have they do have large in, um, farm infrastructures in it. Um, and there is co-ops. But yeah, there, there's every sort of a model out there. You know, if, if you want to get interested in it, you can look at any plant and any sort of a model. Um, yeah, I'd imagine there's some uh, networks establishing around the EU on this as well. I know the yeah. Commission are, are, are quite good at uh, supporting those those types of areas. And, and, and certainly the policy direction is the EU is pushing more towards wastes and residues. And that is it's very important in terms of farming. It's like, well, if you're producing your food and you have a residue or something left over and feed that into AD, that they really don't see these maize-fed AD plants as being positive. So that's when people ask, they're like, oh, beet, maize. And I'm like, no not a positive in Ireland where we are a grass country we can grow very good yields of grass and we actually can't we're not being allowed to feed that to cows so therefore here's another outlet and and those I mean in Germany in particular massive nitrates problems in water associated with the increase in maize for for those plants uh, yeah under them in, in quite a bit of trouble yeah. uh, sticking with that topic there's a a, a a question with a few a few different pieces in it around air pollution and, and smells. I suppose one of the things you mentioned that there is a higher amount of av- available uh, uh, ammonia nitrogen. Uh, is there a risk that that leads to a higher uh, volatilization of ammonia than would be the case with slurry or where where is that balance? Yeah, so, okay, on smells, there's a big thing if agri versus waste. If you're a food waste plant, that's different to an agri-based plant. So an agri-based AD plant is reducing the smell, basically, compared to your pig slurry, your heavy slurry applications. You drive down the road, you can smell those. Spread digestate, you're meant to reduce that smell, basically. There is a higher ammonia content, so we'll need to be careful about how it's used. And that's I think it'll be very important in shifting the mindset. Spreading digestate, you're spreading fertilizer. You're not getting rid of a waste. There's too many farmers viewing the slurry as a waste. It's heavy, full of water. We need to just get rid of it. And that's not going to be sustainable into the future. You've got a resource there. You've got N, P, and K sitting there. Now, I get it with slurry because it's not very available and there is lots of water and it's difficult to manage. You've got hours to spread it. However, if we're making it into a fertilizer, this needs to be controlled. This needs to be well applied. You're going to have to have your soil samples, do you know what I mean, to know what your crop needs to then spread it. And then it's going to be low emissions. But like, if you look at the systems in the UK, they've got like dribble bars to 30 meters. So they're top dressing crops with this stuff. Like, and that's, so I think with the infrastructure, we could do this, you know, but it, it is going to take storage. It is going to take much bigger plant, much bigger machinery and much lower pressure, ground pressure, stuff like that. There is a lot of things to be done to, to make this sustainable. I'm not just saying it's a quick swap one for the other and we're solving everything. We need to do everything right to get this to operate Morris, correctly. Is there a um, an issue with the, 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 with the question here at the P&K prices that are now a lot higher than uh, previous years at, at today's PK prices? What price would need it be to be paid per tonne to make, or the cost per tonne to make uh, 400 uh, euros per hectare profit? So uh, that, comparing to other on, on enterprises. Yeah, that, that was at 40 euro a tonne for silage. Now, I have modelled it for 2022 to look at basically mid-war in Ukraine, high nitrogen prices, um, and it's still, it, it's up at 50 
and 55 euro i think per ton of silage and um, now at the same time it's very interesting once you actually model 2022 with that high n and p and k values the the advantage of red clover is just massive and when you do model it and look at 18 to 20 there isn't that huge economic driver in terms of shifting towards grass red clover because you have these other risks and these other management things but look at high input prices and you're like jesus every farmer would adopt it if they saw the money that they could save by doing this and that's i think there will need to be that economic shift for farmers to say look it's worth it taking the risk of converting and learning how to grow red clover learning how to grow our multi species um, and because it, it all comes farmers, down to management. Uh, for those farmers, Morris, that are reliant on maybe buying in silage, I mean, are they right to feel a bit nervous about the, the, the AD and the, the effect that it could have on driving the cost of forage? Yeah, I mean, look, the question is, if you're buying in silage at €30 Euro a tonne and an AD plant is down the road paying more per tonne, you probably will get nervous. But right now, you're probably not in a sustainable farming system because that farmer is probably losing money in terms of the NP and K value in that silage that he's selling to you at 30 euro a ton. So right now, yes, you've got a nice system, but that's at the expense of farmer a farmer down the road. So that's in a full system every, and a fully sustainable system, everyone makes money. You know, I, I don't see it being a huge threat to the dairy industry, but it that comes down to collaboration, though. If if the dairy people, if people see the AD plant as being a competitor and a foe, yes, it is going to be an issue. And people are going to be bidding for land to be like, I want it for me. But if it's a collaboration and it's saying, look, you, you need the slurry, I can provide you the slurry. I actually want the grass first into the AD plant and I want first cut silage for the animals. Second and third cut might actually be suitable for the AD plant. That might be actually the most greenhouse gas efficient system in terms of food production and that. But if we keep the, the everyone being enemies, yes, it is going to cause issues. Yeah. And that silage then, does that need to be, that would need to be stored year round? Um, question here. I mean, does that mean that there would be substantial extra on farm storage required and a substantial cost associated with that? Yeah, that and and, and I suppose the question is, are do farmers put in the storage for, for um, silage and for digestate, or is this centralised? And I think that'll be a balance um, between the scale of farms and do farms want to have that infrastructure on the farm themselves? Um, so that's like, and we did that in the survey, actually, we kind of looked to see what like, would be the business model. Do farmers want to sell the standing crop? Do they want to make the silage and sell the silage? And the answer was kind of, people want a bunch of farmers want different things you know some farmers be happy to just let the contractor make everything look after everything some farmers want to make the silage themselves and then they'd be paid on the biogas output of the silage you know so that's i I think each each and every model will come out to it because farms are so diverse you know what suits each farmer will be slightly different um Sorry, a question there. Do, do you think uh, growing silage for AD will redu- re- uh, will result in a reduction in hay meadows, which benefit ground nesting birds? Or I, I suppose there's there's always a question there as to whether you're uh, getting land which has been traditionally farmed but more uh, extensively. And yeah, how, so uh, that's there's a whole biodiversity piece that we're doing actually in. A, in working on but basically yeah i i wouldn't be advocating that we should be plowing up lovely diverse grassland to put in things to put in multi-species so but if there is a diverse grassland you know maybe there is a case to say look this actually is if you manage what you have there to to maximize biodiversity you have a feedstock that basically maybe you have to harvest it in july or august and shift that management but i I think that farmer would need to be valued for what he's producing do you know what i mean and so that's and then if if it's arable land that's been plowed for years and years i think there is a biodiversity benefit of putting in multi-species but we do need to be careful what type of grassland it is and what sort of diversity is associated with it and but yeah there is there's rules within red too but that's you, okay. We need to be careful of unintended consequences. There's a questioner here wanting to get down to brass tacks and and looking at the the uh, uh, I suppose prices of of, of three uh, items. One is is the the price of the the input silage, but looking then at the potential for gas and electricity. What kind of pricing are you looking for at both ends to make this thing work? 
So look, at, at the silage side of things, exporting it from the farm, you are talking about 35 euro, 40 euro a ton historically. So bring that to 22, the price of diesel and everything has gone up. You are talking higher prices. In terms of natural gas, once we're in, when we were mid-2022 with gas prices super high, things actually looked pretty good. And um, now we're back to pre-war prices at five cent a kilowatt. So the price of biomethane might be twice or nearly three times the price of fossil gas. And that's, we do need customers who are willing to pay that to decarbonize their systems. So that's, those are the big questions. Will customers pay that higher price for biobetane? Now, the goal is that actually customers are blending in 5% biomethane. So therefore they only have to buy a small percentage of biomethane. And that's what we're doing in diesel. Right now we're all buying 5 and 6% biodiesel and biopetrol. We don't know it because it's just at the petrol pump, but it'll be down to those big suppliers. We'll have to buy a percentage of biomethane, and that's how it'll create. Once we have an industry, we can work on the economics and, and things will probably improve. But biomethane is always going to be more expensive than fossil gas. And how I explain it is you've got a pipe coming out of the ground with fossil gas, turn it on, turn it off. That's the cost involved in, in gas. Well, simplify it. Biomethane, you are growing grass, you're collecting slurry, you're dealing with digestate, you've got benefits to agriculture, benefits to soil. There's all sorts of things there and societal benefits and um, waste processing, things like that. So it does have higher costs. And the issue is that it's benefiting multiple sectors. So it's not just one, all the benefits are in one sector. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so Sorry, Pat, just on the transport of silage to AD plants. Um, person saying here is this not a waste of energy, and will it put more pressure on our rural road network? And uh, that land should be uh, dedicated to food production. So obviously, this person is concerned. Yeah, look, and and that's under red too, right? You can you can only spend so much on diesel on transport because you start eking into your like what your quota is. Um, on food production, listen, farmers aren't being paid for producing food. So, like, unless customers start paying for what we're producing, like, if we're in the, in the we can't go green if we're in the black. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's, price of food is too cheap. So in, in that context, yes, I get the food versus energy. There is a debate there. But at the same time, there's a simple economic argument. We're not making money as farming. We're losing money. So... What's the moral implication that we have to keep producing food and lose money? Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a it's a fair point, uh, and I suppose it's that we're operating within this context at the moment that uh, food prices are where they are. Yeah, uh, and that's I so. I think it, the advantage as well though is it, it would create competition in terms of food suppliers. The processors might have to pay more to guarantee that they get food delivered, and competition is healthy basically for efficiency. Just a, a question there in terms of seasonality. Do you see this as being because we're only producing slurry in the in the winter? Uh, so do you see it uh, uh, that we're going to have to put in a lot more storage, say, than our competitors abroad because of because of that fact? Uh, and does that make it potentially uh, uh, uneconomic? Yeah, we're we're going to be very different than than Europe, and um, because a lot of them have housed all year round systems, and that's we're talking, and it's the advantage of pig slurry during the summer; they are housed cattle slurry. It is winter slurry, so it is going to be a different system to what's out there. Will it, it will it drive up the price? Yes, it will drive up the price, but equally that. More storage would be positive because the more we can spread slurry in the correct soil conditions and the correct weather conditions, the better it is going to be for wet, for our water quality. And water quality has to improve. We have to get come to terms with that and get on board with trying to improve water quality. So having six months of storage, I don't think is a negative for agriculture. I think it'd be a positive. Okay. A, uh, a question there in in relation to the storage of, of silage and I suppose the, the dry matter of silage, is it more suitable to have a high uh, a high water content silage or are you, when you're talking about 40 euro a ton, like you can have anything from 18 to 40% to, to dry matter in that silage. So yeah, exactly. That. So in terms of transport, you want high dry matter. Um, in terms of the actual silage for AD, it is a slightly different silage than the, the silage for for cattle so like you want you probably do want slightly higher chop but there's an advantage that water content 
you know, the water effluent from a silage pit, you can feed straight into an AD plant. It's got the energy, it'll you'll extract it out of it. So there actually probably does need to be some work done on what's the exact type of silage and how should it be preserved to maximize the biomethane output as opposed to maximizing, you know, milk production or something like that. Uh, a question there. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. Did Chagas have any specialized AD or bioeconomy advisors? Uh, no advisors yet, I don't think, but no, there is a to advisory there who, who's dealing with this, Barry Caslan. Uh, yeah. And Barry talked about being with us, but he's he's on leave today. So he, he and he's done presentations in the past for us. Yeah, look, it, it's it's a very nascent um sector. But we don't have a huge amount of advisors knowledge on it and farmer knowledge on it. So there's going to have to be a big body of work done and on on just societal knowledge on it. The question here: the the additional transport demand for to to operate uh, ad plants is that taken into consideration when you're looking at the the net effect of ad in in terms of its its green credentials yeah exactly you have to account for everything so what what fertilizer goes onto the silage what you know how far it's traveling all of that needs to be accounted on the end day at the end with the biomethane leaving so that's we have to do more transport modeling it, it's complicated but at the end of the day you know someone's going to have to be accounting for it and in time i think there could be advantages for the farmer that if you were selling some silage into the id plant you're auditing the silage side of it you might as well audit the rest of the farm and then see what what are you sequestering in terms of carbon all these other bits so hopefully there should be knock-on benefits to farmers in terms of those auditing yeah, it's just there's a question there in 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 relation to to maize crops. Uh, are they not better for AD? But I think it's more around the other problems that that they uh, have. Yeah, so so maize for the AD plant is rocket fuel. Yes, but the issue is what what does it do to your soil if you're harvesting in wet conditions like we have now? And are you leaving a bare soil over winter? And are you plowing that soil to grow the maize? Do you know, so I. Maize could be grown sustainably, you know, with intercropping and with other understory to look after soil structure, stuff like that. It's not necessarily banned. I'm just saying the way we see maize done in in other countries, we're not we're not looking at blanket maize everywhere. I, I was yeah. talking to one AD plant and they were happy to buy maize, but they didn't want it on their own land for fear of soil health. A question there, has straw got any value or is it just too fibrous? Straw is a residue and it has carbon. It can be used. It take a bit of processing maybe you know and chopping but might get rid of some of that black grass and other things as well it might be handy question just around the the ad plant in range uh morris at what stage is that at uh when, when will that be coming on stream 2024 hopefully waiting on delivery um supply chain issues waiting on delivery of components basically is the is okay. the issue at the moment so that 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 will be open for farmers to to come and visit or, or yeah. industry yeah. and go on and see. That's see. the beef day. There's normally there's normally stands and generally you'll find me there talking about it. Great, great. Look, we're we're up at uh, ten thirty, and um, unfortunately, we don't have the time to go through all of the questions. Huge, huge interest this morning uh, on this topic, Morris. So I think uh, we'll have to make another date uh, in yeah, twenty twenty four. There's more to chat. But, and uh, people can reach out to me as well. Uh, you know, I'm happy to discuss. Yeah, great, great. Well, your contact details are on the the Chagas website. So, uh, if you, if anyone does have a question uh, that they want to to run by Morris, um, I'm sure you're 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 happy to to engage there. Um, so thank you, Morris. Really appreciate you coming along today. And uh, we'll we'll more. I'm sure we'll be in touch in 2024. Um, uh, Pat, thanks very much for helping with questions. No problem. Uh, next week, just, we'll just to say, there was one uh, person you certainly got to because the last comment coming in on the questions was it was an amazing talk. Now, <laughs> there you go. There's high praise, Morris. You can take that one with you. So, next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Sinead McCarthy, who leads the Chagas Consumer Behavior Research Program. And uh, Sinead's going to be talking to us about sustainable diets and balancing uh, personal and planetary health. Uh, so um, I know I've seen uh, Sinead's talk, really, really interesting. So I hope you can join us for that next uh, Friday morning. So until then, enjoy the weekend and hopefully the weather doesn't get too much colder. Um, but uh, I hope you stay safe and well. Thanks for uh, joining us again. 
You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.